Thank you all for being here. I, I'm sure um, for those of you who are students that this is probably one of the busiest time for you. Um, I have two uh, of my own in college, so I, I know um, the level of intense stress that you <laughs> must be under. Um, I, I hope uh, tonight, as I, as I speak and as we converse, uh, as we dialogue, that this will be a meaningful time for you. I was uh, this afternoon uh, visiting Morton Lauritsen, who is the premier um, composer of a time, I think. She, he is uh, well known for his um, Lux Eterna, um, com uh, uh, this magnificent composition of uh, choral music that um, uh, after 9-11, many of the radio stations, um, NPR stations, put Lux Eterna on, on the loop um, because um, it was probably one of the few contemporary music that could withstand the weight of that day and bring healing um, in the midst of the darkness. Um, one of the greatest joys that I had as my um, serving on the National Council on the Arts was to recommend him to receive the national medals. And uh, then Chairman Dana Joya, uh, who also is an admirer of Morton Lordson, um, we uh, en endeavor to present his case. And he was quite surprised when he received it. Uh, no, noticed that uh, he was going to be receiving the National Medal of the Arts uh, with a remarkable list of people, actually. Andrew Wyeth, before he passed away, um, we were really happy to uh, see him honored, um, as well as Les Paul. <laughs> yeah, he's really, I mean, where would we be without Les Paul? It's guitars. <laughs> Um, and uh, Morton was quite surprised, but you know, there's no other really composer in our time that has affected so many people, uh, millions of people, literally sing his music. And American choral music is one of the greatest gifts that we have to the world. Um, and it is distinctively American. And it has this powerful influence. And I, as I spoke to him and, and um, got to know where he comes from creatively, there was this sense, um, the, the, something that I, I wanted to start out this evening with, because why, why the arts? You know, why music? Why drama? Why dance? Why beauty? And for him, it is his calling to bring the transcendent into the ordinary. So choir is not something that you can easily control who's going to participate in. So he, as a composer, has basically humbled himself to make music that is accessible, and he are gloriously beautiful. Um, and to do that, you know, he was saying that he runs rather transgressive to the uh, reality of, comp you know, the composer's world um, in 20th century. And he is literally composing something um, in, in a way that is unusual, <laughs> um, and it's remarkable to think that uh, something like choral music can, can be transgressive, but it is, and it, it takes courage to do that. Um, and in what I do as an artist, I'm, I'm always um, navigating uh, in, in this contemporary art world, uh, world of Nihonga, Japanese-style paintings, uh, in uh, what 
you might call more abstract um, tradition, abstract expressionist um, works and um, contemporary collaborative installations and so forth. And my works really don't fit into any of those, actually. Um, I, I, I think I've gotten to a point where I'm, I, I dare say that I'm, I create to <laughs> break down those categories. Um, and uh, in, in some ways, I think my art shares in, in that um, broader perspective, uh, desire to be able to speak to the masses if, if possible. Um, one of the great treasures, uh, experiential treasures that I have is um, that in recent solo show in New York, um, I had this series of paintings up and um, my, my son and my daughter-in-law got married in front of them, <laughs> um, which is really sweet, yeah. But the next week, a total stranger, an AP reporter that I did not know, had passed away and her friend came to me and said, can we have the memorial service at your gallery space with your paintings in the background? I was really deeply touched by that, um, that a wedding and a memorial service can happen in, in my exhibit. And a friend of mine said, um, you know, that's really unusual in contemporary art. Yeah, I, I can't imagine getting married, <laughs> getting married in front of Jeff Koons. <laughs> <laughs> That shows like the range of people who knows what, who Jeff Koons is in the back. Um, you, know, you know what I mean? Like the, there's this gap between uh, ordinary everyday experiences and the celebration, communal experience that art was always part of. Now we live in a time where things are fragmented and uh, especially in the fine arts and contemporary art, um, there is this distance. And so you walk into a gallery in Chelsea and you know, if you don't know anything about contemporary art, you know, you're kind of intimidated. <laughs> you don't know what you're looking at. And, and uh, the directors, you know, they're sitting there and I think they're supposed to make you feel uncomfortable, you know, <laughs> to feel more intimidated. Um, but, um, so I wanted to start with that. Um, the, we were talking about this project, uh, the Four Holy Gospels, which I spent the last two years, um, two and a half years now, working on and exhibiting um, all over the place. And this came about because I, I was asked by Crossway Publishing, um, Lane Dennis is the president of Crossway and he called me and uh, he said the next, uh, next year is the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible and we would like to commission you to illumine the four holy gospels. And by the way, I just want you to know that this has not been done, the commissioning on a single artist for four holy gospels has not been done in 400 years. <laughs> 400 years, and uh, I was like, you, you got to be kidding me. That cannot be true. It, it is true. There's been notable exceptions. Um, St. John's effort out uh, in Minnesota and uh, Donald Jackson led calligraphers to work together on, on the entire Bible. It's a magnificent effort. Um, but again, that is a collaborative effort. Um, the, there has been few attempts to tie in um, biblical text with art, but it was never something that was commissioned by a publisher to an artist directly. And so uh, accepting Barry Moser's uh, woodcuts that um, uh, has uh, illustrated uh, many of the biblical texts um, 
and William Blake, um, and and a few exceptions, this relationship between art and biblical text has has been severed, and that gap, I wonder, um, has something to do with what we experience in culture today, that there is no integration happening in in this critical place called the Bible and us, uh, humanity. And, and so you end up with uh, this fragmented world, world view. And uh, oftentimes what happens in the church, divisions, the ideological fragmentation, all these things end up playing out um, in, in the wider world. Um, church is often the leader in this, for, for good or for ill. <laughs> so we have to realize that the, the, the fragmentation that we are experiencing in the church is very much um, part of culture at large. So Maud and I were talking about um, this um, project and um, how unique this was, and we, and I, I, I told him that you know I, I, I had his music playing in the background as I painted these images. Um, I'm so glad that I'm able to tell him that. Um, um, and there's something about this project in particular that really forced me to um, listen, listen well, listen to the Word of God, but also to listen to the flow of the text. And to simplify it and essentiate, um, which is not a word, but I made this up, essentiate, um, reality to the, the barest possible place so that the, the, it, can, it can hold together things, very complex things. And I think that's the gift of abstraction, is that it can bring all these um, fragmented elements together. And I think uh, in 20th century, uh, in examples of abstract expressionists and, and uh, many painters, um, that was kind of the um, desire uh, that came out of them. Um, this show was at Mobia, Museum of Biblical Art uh, in New York City, uh, right on Broadway. <laughs> I heard it described recently. I, was, I, I never really thought about that. It's on Broadway, yes. And uh, it's, it's, it's in a premier location, and I, I was so honored to participate in their exhibit of the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. But when you think about it, when you actually just go see an exhibit like this, you realize that uh, visual um, the images and, and the text has um, gone separate ways. And in an exhibit such as this, it would be very hard to mount a museum visual exhibit just with the Bible. It, you know, from the illuminated Bibles of medieval times to Reformation times to post-Reformation, images begin to slip away. And so when Anna Heller, the director of Mobia, uh, approached me, she literally said, we need images. <laughs> And there's so few people who are working um, to bring uh, biblical texts and images together um, that um, she was um, very happy to have these pieces up. And, and I was very moved because when I came to New York, um, not knowing whether I can make a career out of my art, um, I didn't know Valerie Didn, my gallery um, owner who's, uh, who's been representing my work for 15 years now. 
Um, I didn't really know anyone. And uh, my first show in New York was at, Mo was at American Bible Society, which is now Movia, um, American Bible Society Gallery. Um, and you see these books in the back. There are um, precious um, objects and books, uh, Bibles, illumined manuscripts. Um, that, that is just a remarkable collection that they have. And Dr. Lupus, who wrote the catalog essay for this exhibit, I remember her taking me around the library and it was such a wonderful experience. Um, she's so knowledgeable. She spent hours with me opening up some of the illuminated manuscripts, which I had fascination with, because illuminated manuscripts of me uh, medieval times use the same materials that I use. Ground up pigments, gold, um, sometimes silver, um, and uh, done on parchment papers. And, and so the, there's uh, Ovedum. Um, so there's, there's this connection between that world and my world. And um, I, I long to bring those two together, the contemporary art world and the medieval world, uh, both East and West. So I, um, I remember walking around this library, you know, and um, opening these books and and so when I did this exhibit this summer, um, it, it, was, it was like coming home <laughs> and being able to um, display these works, um, which um, took this considerable effort to bring together these elements um, and, and to essentiate. We uh, live in this world, this is by Damien Hirst, a British artist. Um, who would probably, uh, those of you who knew Jeff Koons, know who he, who he is. Um, but I, I raise this issue, this problem, because um, I think, in in a sense, we have lost. You know, we're, we're like swimming in this water that that has been so tainted that we don't even think that there's air. <laughs> um, Damien Hirst is a highly successful figure um, who I actually admire very much. He is a remarkable artist and very smart thinker. And he's, he's also dealing with this fragmentation, but dealing with it in, in, a, in a completely different way. On the day that Lehman Brothers collapsed, I was in Japan having sushi with the head of Sotheby's Hong Kong. And his phone is ringing and ringing off the hook um, because Damien Hurst was at the same time um, auctioning this work. It's called For the Love of God. It's a platinum cast of human skull encrusted with 8,601 diamonds. And his grandmother saw this uh, in his studio, and she said, for the love of God. <laughs> so he named it for the love of God. So on September 22nd, right, 2008, Lehman Brothers fighting Chapter 11 bankruptcy. My phone is ringing because my gallery owner, Valerie Dillon, is going crazy. That uh, entire art market is going to collapse. Um, this artist um, is well known for his, um, many of his installations placing cut up animals in formaldehyde. 
Uh, you might have seen that in Time Magazine and so forth. So this, while the, this was happening, he, he, for the first time in history, skipped the middleman in auction scene. In other words, you usually auction, you know, the work, work of art goes from the, the artist to a gallery, gallery to a collector, and so forth. And it's usually way down the stream that the auction happens. So artists have no control over it. But for the first time in history, he skipped all that, and he auctioned this himself. <laughs> now, I, I, as I said, he's very smart. What he realized is that today in 21st century, the power is at, at the hand of the creators. You know, it used to be that if you're a musician, right, you're dependent on record labels discovering you, giving you a contract, so that you can make your career so, uh, so at least sustainable. Today, it's not true. There's this long tail effect. There's the, the Amazon. There's this um, all sorts of mechanisms that allow you to create on your own, create your own ecosystem, create a niche market, and, and make that sustainable, okay? Um, publishing industry is the same thing. It used to be that you had to go to New York and meet up with editors and you know, stand in line, basically, so your manuscript can, can be looked at. Today, they're, they're, uh, you know, Amazon sells more books <laughs> who are uh, uh, either self-published or independently published, smaller publishing companies than all the best sellers combined. So the market is shifting, and Damien Hurst is one of the first people in the art world to recognize this. He said, we do not need a gallery system. We do not even need a middle person to bring my work into the auction scene. I can do it myself. And he did it. On the day that Lehman Brothers collapsed, he sold all of his collection. And uh, so he was probably being uh, rather prophetic here, in a sense that uh, this economic system is, is going to be turned around, or turned upside down. And, and uh, people who are creating has a lot more to say in this picture, in this new reality, than we realize. You know, artists deal with all sorts of uh, <laughs> issues, <laughs> with rather dysfunctional people. Um, and of course, we oftentimes lack in se security and self-confidence and, and so forth. But in reality, what Damien Hurst is communicating is that this is a new world, a new world in which if you are a creative individual and entrepreneurial, um, able to see the big picture, um, but have, have the ability uh, to create something uh, to, to undermine or upset or transgress against the system, this, this is now possible. It was a tipping point, I think. Um, so in, in, in that background, we have this tension between a commoditized view of art, which Damien Hurst is perfectly willing to walk right into, and the, the world of art that always was, which lived a little bit aloof from the capitalistic mechanism of the world. Um, and I'm going to take you back to 18th century, because I, I think this is critical that we, when we try to understand ourselves and where we fit in as artists, and to answer this question, why art? You have to kind of navigate through history a little bit and, and, and 
poke your head out of the water <laughs> of contemporary uh, streams of, of culture. So I'm going to talk about this remarkable artist, Ito Jakshu, whose works are at the Smithsonian, uh, at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. right now until April 29th. I so wish you can go to see this uh, exhibit. This series of scrolls, 30 scrolls, were held by the Imperial Palace of Japan, never exhibited before two years ago. And I was very fortunate that I was in Japan and I was able to go see these works. And the works that um, were, these 30 scrolls that were displayed were absolutely in perfect condition because of that. I, I know, uh, uh, I, I have a friend, I went to school with a friend who's a conservator and who, who works at the National Gallery in, in Tokyo. So he was telling me of the process conser cons as a conservator, um, what they had to go through to keep these works in indelible condition. Imagine seeing the Declaration of Independence right here as if it was signed yesterday. No blemish, <laughs> no damage whatsoever. These works, 30 works, were done 10 years before the Declaration of Independence was signed. And they are in impeccable condition. What kind of a culture <laughs> would allow this to happen or manifest itself in such a way that literally 200 years later, these works can be seen with a naked eye and there is just this remarkable condition. Now, of course, Ito Jakchu is far more <laughs> than just about the preserved uh, condition of silk or paint. He is a genius of first order. Uh, he is the Michelangelo of Japan. Very prolific artist who uh, worked in a merchant town of Osaka for uh, many years running businesses. And then at the age of 40, he decided that he was going to devote his, his time to art. And his, his life is, is rather remarkable. And uh, it's uh, fortunately very well documented because of he was rather a public figure. And he, um, he basically placed himself under the tutorage of um, uh, Shotokuin Buddhist temple where these works were dedicated to. And what's, what's amazing is that there is this letter written to one of the priests, uh, one of the abbots at uh, Shotokuji temple. And um, it literally says, these 30 scrolls done in memory of my father and, and to, um, to be gifted to the temple um, to preserve the memory of my family. It may quite be that these works will last 1,000 years <laughs> and the people will be seeing these works um, in, in, in millennia. Remarkable vision. And um, I'll show you some of the images. It's these uh, are birds and flower paintings, but they, they're really parables of Buddhistic uh, texts. And there he is juxtap juxtaposing the, the grand tradition of birds and flower paintings from China um, and the, the decorative tradition of Japan um, in, in, in this series of uh, scrolls. Uh, the exhibit is called Colorful Realm, Japanese Bird, bird and Flower Paintings, and um, uh, it's at the National Gallery until 29th. Uh, it is an amazing experience going through this. These are done on silk, 
uh, with minerals, uh, same type of materials that I use. Um, but I think you can see an early uh, precursor of Japan animation here in Ito Jakushu's work. Uh, both Takashi Murakami, who is a friend of mine, um, went to the same school uh, that I did, uh, who is a, uh, really the Andy Warhol of our, our day, um, and um, Hayao Miyazaki, who is the uh, master of animation, has admitted that Jack Chu was their primary influence. Scientifically, anatomically, I mean, they're, they're stunningly accurate. Um, so he was, in a way, the uh, Audubon of his time as well. But these scrolls, I, I have said, are uh, literally the Sistine Chapel paintings of Japan. And uh, it takes a genius to bring together um, these various elements using a traditional format and melding it into something brand new. Here's a phoenix, rare in Japan. There's only one other painting, uh, which was also a shotokuji and uh, shotokuji, um, that Jakshu probably copied and learned from. But you think, what was he thinking? A resurrection bird. What was he thinking? when uh, Japan was closed to outside influence with the greatest persecution of Christians uh, in history, really. Um, close up of the silk. Amazing how beautiful the silk weaving uh, is still to this day um, kept intact and, and yet it's so fluid um, um, I, I was uh, standing next to a uh, uh, curator of Freer Museum, <laughs> and I, I asked him, is it possible that these, the silk was created particularly for these paintings? Because I, never, I have never seen this weaving before. And he said, you're probably right. <laughs> he probably had the connections and the prestige to uh, create silk for himself. Um, in, in a similar way that Damien Hirst <laughs> can manipulate the market, um, there's, there's something about uh, Jacques paintings that uh, connects with uh, uh, Damien Hirst's paintings as well. OK, back to my work. I wanted to go through these uh, just, just to show you some of the influences um, and, and to remark on uh, some of the questions that I, I've been asking in the creative process that I've been on. Um, I am getting ready to exhibit. Uh, I have a major show, show this fall at Dillon Gallery in November. Um, it's going to be a release of the retrospective monograph that uh, is, is being prepared. And so I'm kind of looking back, you know, at my, my career and thinking about um, w where I am and, and, and to contextualize it. It was so good to talk to Molden today because, you know, for him, um, he, he has attained a level um, of expertise and his, um, craft that, that to me, um, I, I hope one day I, I, I can say that I have attained. And his way of being able to um, constantly be faithful to what he is called to do, um, I, I think is, is a gift to, to me, a gift to humanity. Um, and I hope you will um, listen to his music. <laughs> These are the four Holy Gospels images. Um, I just um, had a show at Christian Culture Center, which is the largest African-American church in, uh, uh, in New York City. 
And uh, I just showed four of these images, uh, the frontispieces that uh, illumine the four holy gospels. Uh, next time these will be shown uh, will be at Yale University next uh, January and February. Um, and they, they will be um, at the sacred um, uh, music s space. Um, so I am considering bringing music into it. Um, so these images, let me show four here. Oops, wait a minute, let me go back. Okay, there you go. Um, really is, is a way to navigate uh, between east and west. Um, it, it's, it's also a way to deal with abstraction and representation, uh, or uh, what, what I call essentiation. <laughs> and uh, trying to create my own language, visual language, informed by all these artists, including Ito Jakchu and other artists of Japan, but also people like Ashio Goki, uh, who is an Armenian artist who immigrated to uh, New York. Um, has a, it was a seminal figure in, in the early abstract expressionist movement, uh, influenced de Kooning and, and others profoundly. Um, and so th these images quote these contemporary artists um, uh, like Gorky, like Rothko, Deben Cohn, a fantastic uh, California artist uh, that I, I really admire. So there, there are many strands of thoughts uh, mixed in uh, to these. But again, I'm trying to uh, narrow these down to a point where um, I, I, I have this playful diversity and yet a um, anchor um, of, um, of what is um, holding all these things together. And um, this is my favorite letter of the whole project. It's an N <laughs> of, um, I spoke on John 11 and John 12 at chapel. Uh, this is John 11, the head letter for John 11. It starts now at Bethany, and this is an N. Of course, it's so abstracted, you probably can't tell it's an N. And so I called the uh, publisher and I said, you know, this is a really good painting. <laughs> Can I use it, you know? Although it's very abstract, and uh, Josh Dennis is a designer there, and said, "Oh, people will figure it out." Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's 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 really um, my favorite. Uh, it, it you know John 11 speaks of Jesus weeping, Jesus wept, Jesus tears, and I I really do feel that uh, that is a profound passage for me um, as I. Uh, navigate this complex uh, reality, um, expanding ground zeros of our days. And I'm trying to find a way to articulate uh, both uh, this lament that I feel about uh, our realities, but, but also hope. Um, and Jesus' tears uh, point to that direction. And uh, in, in, in doing this project, I realized there's so many A's and so many T's, <laughs> if you go through the Bible, um, that um, I had to be a little bit creative um, in producing these letters, um, using um, stencils to uh, just gestural imagery to even having a little fish there, <laughs> being on fire. That's from uh, John 21. And um, Transfiguration A, uh, and the, um, um, the, the, the birth of uh, Christ A, uh, they're all different. But the, um, when I look at this, I, 
I, I'm gratified that the John 11 piece, the end, that's so abstract, <laughs> um, is the centerpiece, really, uh, that holds the other pieces together. Uh, visually, um, when you exhibit these, that's, that's how everything reads. And of course, you're not thinking about how they will be displayed together when you're working on a project like this. You're just simply trying to be faithful to the text, to the flow. Um, but um, I, I perhaps was intuiting that there, there, there is something very central about uh, Jesus wept um, that holds these things together. I'll just show you a last image not a very good one, um, but this is uh, a large painting that I will be exhibiting in November called Golden Sea. And th that would be the title of my monograph. Um, and actually, Morton Lorison's music, choral music, um, overlaps with this image a lot for me. And, and so, um, I'm bringing together these various forms and the themes that I've worked in the past and the materials that I've used, um, trying to remember the people that I've learned Nihonga from um, who have really articulated their love for the materials. Um, manifested in the traditional ways, in some traditional ways, and some decorative ways, but in, in, in nevertheless, um, um, in, in a vital 20th century language. And I'm trying to bring that together into this um, reality of 21st century. And what I'm really interested in is this liminal space between heaven and earth that artists and poets dwell <laughs> in. Uh, the Celts called, called it thin places, and it's, it's, it's where um, angels dwell, I think. And there's ambiguity um, there, there's mystery there, um, but there's profound presence there as well. And so um, I, I hope my work um, points to that. Um, I, I, I am grateful that uh, for the one manifestation of that is a wedding and a memorial service. Um, the, the greatest uh, experience that I had with the four Holy Gospels uh, was here in LA <laughs> at Azusa Pacific University. Um, a group of special education students came in, apparently, and I only heard about this later. But they had gone through the library where they had the uh, King James Bible and Tinsdale and all those Bibles there. The, so the teacher was talking about the historical reality of this. And they came into the gallery where these works were shown, uh, the four Holy Gospels. And they stood there kind of like, why are we here? <laughs> What's the connection? And the teacher brought out the book, opened it, and showed them that these are frontispieces and these are the letters. And she said it was as if this life came back into them. Their faces lit up. And they said, do you mean I can draw in the Bible? <laughs> and the teacher said, yes. <laughs> um, I'm grateful for that. I, I love that. I, I think that's so, um, it tell, tells us so much about where we are in culture. Um, and how, in, in, in some ways, it's something, it's, it's a theme to think about. Whether, whether you, you know, find this a critical issue or not, <laughs> can you draw in the Bible? Um, is it 
Why is it so separated and uh, so strange, you know, <laughs> to even ask that question? And it takes a special ed child to <laughs> articulate it, right? Something that we, we take for granted, that we swim in, and we, we, we've gotten so used to it, and we kind of toil on, um, thinking that creativity and expression and the arts, and it's not just visual, but it's, it's dance, it's poetry, it's theater, uh, have, have been so pushed aside into the peripheries of, of our experience. Um, as in culture, as well as in, in the church. And probably it's fair to say that the church is leading the way <laughs> in cultural conversations. So where have we turned um, that created this divide? And for an artist who longs for a reconciled reality, who wants to be a conduit of um, a window into the gospel. It's a critical question. It's a question that I ask every time I walk into uh, a church um, as a visual person. It's a question that I continue to ask uh, as I work and labor in New York City, Chelsea, our world. Um, and I think it's a critical task for you, for Biola University, to ask. Uh, because 21st century, as Damien Hurst has noted, <laughs> is going to be in the hands of the creatives. Those who have a creative gift is going to set the tone. And can we create something like Morton Lauritsen? that connects literally heaven and earth, transcendent, transcendental uh, reality to an ordinary experience where housewives and, um, and engineers are singing this choral music that is so profound. Can we have art like that, music like that? Can we even bring these fragmented elements together and lead the way? Those are the questions that I, um, I hope you pursue in, in the days to come. I want to thank you for your listening and um, love to take questions. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah. Marco, thank you. Is this on? Yeah, good, good. Um, so uh, we'll take a few questions. Uh, we've, we've got a, a good bit of time, so we'll take some questions yeah. uh, uh, from the audience. And I think the other mic is actually in the back still, uh, as I understand it. Um, and I'll launch with the first couple okay. questions, since I've got the mic. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I'm interested in this, uh, this phrase, uh, drawing in the Bible, that yes. you uh, had at the, at the end there. Um, and certainly there's a great deal of continuity between the work that you do yeah. uh, that exhibits in, uh, well, maybe the work that's on canvas or that's large mm -hmm. scale. There's certainly great continuity between that and what you've drawn in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about the, how, what sort of pressure the text hmm. exerted on sure. the way that you drew in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I actually have these ready to go. <laughs> so, uh, perfect. Uh, you know, I, I really had a, initially uh, a lot of struggle trying to figure this out because ha not having an example for 400 years is not a good thing. <laughs> You know, you, you artists are building on the past, and we're, we're people who are crafting with a language that has already been developed, and you, you're trying to build on those things. And, and since there's this huge gap, 
uh, you're literally going back the eighth century, uh, Book of Kells to uh, Limburg Brothers manuscripts and in, in France and medieval times and, and trying to look at these, these uh, manuscripts um, and realizing that, you know, there's no way that I can approach the level of expertise that these monks spent their entire lifetime just to do that. <laughs> and, and so what I'm left with is, 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 is a rather um, um, limited vocabulary, visual vocabulary that, um, that I can only take baby steps to try to do something that's authentic and um, um, given to me uh, as, as, as a calling. Um, and and I, I, I wrote this in the preface of the, of the Bible, but I really pray that this is, this is a step toward um, other people developing this language, toward integration of the text into uh, illuminations. I think there's a different perspective for illumination work than illustration work. And um, now I, I, I think they are both going at the same, same direction and, and good, actually good illustrators or illuminators. Um, but illumination to me has multiple refractive entry points. Um, so when you look at these ancient texts, there's not just one descriptive dialogue going on. It's not one-to-one -one communication, but it's one-to-many. And so, and actually it's many-to-many, -many <laughs> because while you're illuminating the text, text, you're being illumined yourself by the, by the Holy Spirit. And that process is actually rather uncomfortable. <laughs> It exposes things <laughs> like you don't want to think about, and uh, you know you 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 write, you go into the text, and you realize, like Paul in Romans seven, how wretched you are, that you cannot even do the things that you you want to do, uh, and uh, you know, and 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 so you end up vacillating and. Um, through this time, I, um, I, theologically, I have this, I've been taught um, to navigate between Romans 7 and Romans 8. And uh, my um, old pastor, Clyde Godwin, used to say it's a vortex. You know, you, you go back and forth, you keep going, and you, you because, and I, as, I, as I was working on these images, it, it, every image was, to me, insufficient, <laughs> and and yet it was. Uh, at the same time, there was this grace. So, while I felt wretchedly limited in in, in my abilities, I also felt that there was this audacity, as a child of God. Romans Romans eight, you know. Therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, and this freedom that comes from the gospel allowed me to engage creatively and to work on images that um, can be even playful. Um, so I kept on going. I, I, uh, this is a... a interesting um, point of uh, discussion. Uh, many pages have these lines. And um, people ask, like, what are those lines? <laughs> when I was uh, studying Nihonga, I, I spent six and a half years uh, immersing myself in this ancient, ancient traditional uh, way of painting. And for the first six months, all I did was draw lines like these. They gave me many types of brushes, many types of inks. Um, and then at the end of the six month, I was able to um, be allowed to mix uh, these pulverized pigments and pour into wet lines. 
And when what happens is you, you, be, you become enormously sensitized to the, con to the weather conditions, <laughs> to the materials, that the same line that you drew yesterday on this particular paper is not the same on this silk or this paper. Um, and you just do it over and over until you, you really get that. And then you start uh, copying some old master pieces uh, to learn how actually difficult, how impossible it is to draw lines like Jack Shujiro. Um And I, I thought of the, this um, tense conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees and the religious authorities and um, this tension between grace and law, and how Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to abolish the law. And I thought these lines were perfect <laughs> because they are elemental and fundamental to what I have to do as an artist. But they're like the law. <laughs> they can be very rigid. <laughs> they, they can be used in a way that um, uh, only define the shape. Um, whereas you can, <laughs> what happened on this page, uh, this is uh, Luke 18, was that I made a mistake up on top. <laughs> this drip happened. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, you can see it. Um, and so I was going to start over. And, and then uh, I realized that the bottom of the page is, is after Jesus had, had been you know, arguing with the Pharisees for a while. Uh, disciples <laughs> were holding children back. They wanted to come you know, and meet Jesus. And uh, disciples were like, no, they're having a serious theological discussion. Stay away. You know? <laughs> Actually, it happens all the time in churches, right? Kids start crying in the back, you know, <laughs> they have to leave. Um, last time I spoke at Phoenix, this literally happened. Like, I was talking about this, and this child started crying in the back. And the you know, mother was like so embarrassed and began to step out. I said, stop, <laughs> stay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the whole point. <laughs> and, and, and so I just had fun with this. I made this beautiful mess. Um, fireworks of color exploding um, because Jesus said that the children come to me, to those who belong to the kingdom of God. And I want to be there. I want to be that child um, who got to meet Jesus and uh, sit on his lap, so. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask one more question. Yes. And, and, and if you have a question, uh, you can raise your hand and I'll scurry over to meet you. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, I'm interested in, uh, you used a, a, a couple of phrases. At one point you said um, that you like to create, or that you create to break down categories, yeah. uh, such as abstract yeah. expressionists and so on. Yeah. Uh, and then later, uh, uh, you talked about creating your own visual language, needing mm -hmm. to create your own mm -hmm. visual language. And I certainly see a lot of that here as, as well, it, it, that you're um, working in a tradition that has a huge gap in it, mm -hmm. 400 mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. evidently. <laughs> um, and, and so there's this kind of interpretive problem that I imagine you run up right, against. Right. And so I'm interested in how you feel about the way that your work has been written about, mm. spoken about, mm. and how much responsibility you feel like you have to take for mm. shaping the reception mm. of your work mm. and shaping the interpretive categories that are applied to your work, well, given mm. that they're disruptive of categories and disruptive of right, right, right. existing visual Well, Well, that's, that's, that's a... Great question. Um, you, you know, it, it's in a way fortunate to, I guess, to be written about, well, you know, whether it's good or bad, you know. So I would say that I, I'm, I'm always uh, thankful uh, that somebody is 
paying attention to you. And uh, but you know, I I always um, do do wonder if uh, if those things are. I mean, I I hope there aren't any critics in the room, but um, as important as they seem to be. Um, and I, I it's it's not that you know I. I don't read them or I don't think about them, but, but it, it really is very similar to, like I, I've learned actually, I've learned as an artist not to be a critic of my own work in the studio. <laughs> it, it takes discipline to do that. Um, and, and the reason that I learned this and I, I had to learn this uh, it, it could be just because of my temperament, but um, I, I needed to be able to let go of that side of me in order to create well. Um, and again, that may not work for everyone, but um, so now when I'm do, doing a show or doing something like this, you, you have to think about the audience and you have to think about kind of your responsibility you know, to uh, communicate something. So you're really trying to figure out um, very carefully, uh, you are being your own critic and you are trying to discern, you know, is, is this good enough to show or, or is, is this, you know, is, is this image, it's gonna go in the Bible, you know? So, I mean, that's quite a pressure, right? So, so you're, you're really thinking like, oh my goodness, you know, <laughs> I made this beautiful mess, and it kind of goes into the text, as you can see. Um, so is that a problem? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, so those things you you think about, and a lot of times with with critical writings. Um, kind of feel the same way. I, 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 I neither dis dismiss it or, or embrace it. I, it. It doesn't mean much to me as an artist. Um, and I, 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 don't know, I don't know why I, I came to that conclusion. <laughs> like, uh, other than just, just realizing that, you know, only time will tell whether my work is good or not. Um, all I can do <laughs> is, is to polish and remove all the stuff that uh, even I want for my work, but, but to find that slice of expression that is purely and only that I, I am called to do. And that, that takes enormous discipline in itself, you know, to, to, be, to be able to get to that point, to, to have that mindset, and to carry that out you really don't want any other voice to, you know, enter that process. Afterwards, yes, you know, in the exhibits, yes. I mean, I, you're, you know, you, you're listening to things that people say about your work and, and those things, you know, you have to kind of develop a thick skin because, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of like anything else, it's, it, especially in New York, you hear all sorts of things. But, um, but I ultimately, it, 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 it's, it, it's not that important to me. <laughs> yeah. so, Good, so. any questions out there? Way in the back. Way in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, I don't know if you kind of indirectly answered this already, but um, what do you hope the general public uh, experience from your work? Hmm. And if different, what do you hope other artists um, get from hmm. your work or your, your life or you yeah. as an artist? And then also the other question I'd like to add is, um, how do you feel about craft? Since I can see that you spent a lot of time learning um, The craft skills. side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, Craft is very, very important, um, and I, I care uh, about that, uh, that your hands are a part of the creative process. And um, 
I, I think many, many of you in the audience uh, may not realize this, but um, a lot of the works in, in the market right now of the art world is not painted by the artist. Okay, I, I hope that's not a shock. <laughs> uh, and and it's, it's Jeff Koons that doesn't paint. Uh, he ha hires people to paint his images. Um, Damien Hurst actually is transgressing against him, himself by painting images by himself right now, which is absolutely brilliant because it's the most transgressive thing that you can do today in this plastic culture is to actually hold a brush, start painting. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? What, what a world we live in, right? Um, so um, craft is very important to me. I went to undergraduate um, at Bucknell University, and I was under a painter, uh, watercolorist, Neil Anderson. And he was one of the color, color real, realists, and um, he talked about craft a lot. And, and I, I got steeped in this, you know, I accepted it as, as a norm, but I realized after graduating and, and then going to art school and all that, how, how transgressive that was to, 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 to today's culture. And I, I'm, I'm very thankful for what he instilled in me. And then having gone to Japan and then learning the craft of, of, of medieval, um, nature was, was really reinforced that side of me, that, that there is something very important about your own hands creating something. Um, now, um, for, for your the other question, I, um, I, my desire is to bring forth an authentic image um, that that identifies the tensions of our days or uh, articulates it in such a way um, that it leads you to hope. Um, that's, my, that's my hope, <laughs> uh, is that art can somehow open the window when there is despair and there's loss and, um, and that's, that's really difficult to do <laughs> because you really have to enter the darkness first and um, that gets me in trouble sometimes and I, I, I need accountability to do that actually. Um, and, and this whole process, you know, is, is a process that, that really makes me um, <laughs> need hope um, in, in the process of doing it. And, and so um, to me, that's, that's what I am trying to do. And for other artists, I would think that, um, you know, I, I always said that a great masterpiece, um, a work of art that is a masterpiece is pregnant. That, that it, is, it is literally something that's about to give birth and you know, you, the audience, or the artists you know, of next generation come to it and, and see, the, see the potential, see the possibilities of what can be birthed. And, and it, it, it becomes a conduit, it becomes a catalyst for, for your journey, for your creative journey, for your um, calling uh, to be fulfilled. And um, so I see that in works of Van Gogh. I, um, I see that um, in literature. Uh, reading Emily Dickinson is like that for me. Uh, that there's they just this burst that happens when, when you encounter a great work of art. Morton Lawrence's music is like that. It's just generative. It brings forth new new life <laughs> to me, and so I hope that my work uh, does that uh, as well. So, okay. <laughs> yes, there's a question in the back. Could you say more about what you mean by 
needing accountability to go mm. into go into darkness. darkness. Yeah, as soon as I said that, I was like, okay, okay I'm going to have to explain this. I, I think it's, it's both spiritual and creative accountability. Um, and uh, definitely spiritual because, you know, you, you really, art expo exposes a lot in the process. And artists have... Um, a certain responsibility that I, I think no other occupation has. And therefore, it's critical to understand in, in the growth of a young artist, uh, especially, that this is uh, not just, um, you know, an educational element, but, but it's, a, it's a communal reality. That we, we have to really understand that artists have a particular call, and it is, it can be very dangerous if, if, if left alone. You know, if, if it's, not a, it's not linked to some so, sorts of uh, process in which, uh, which love is involved. And, and so uh, creative process um, uh, needs care, um, needs attention. And um, so, you know, and, and I, I speak like this and people say, well, you know, you're no different from a plumber, you know, a taxi driver, so why would you say that, you know? And I say, yes, there, there is something different about it, being an artist than being a plumber. Um, and I, I don't mean it to be an elitist thing and say, you know, this is a special group of people, you know, <laughs> you have to be coddled or something. Um, but, but it is true, and I think it's, this is a reality that we have to wrestle with um, as a community. Uh, if we want art to reach into the darkest realities that people are experiencing, that's, that's a um, you know, heavy <laughs> calling. And, now, if we believe that, then we can also say that art as a gift can open up this possibility of hope, possibility of a um, um, shalom that, that can bring together these um, elements. And, and therefore, in some ways, the incarnation of the gospel is connected with the creative act of uh, people. Um, really, everyone, but artists are the ones that allow, you know, they're, they're the, the initial, um, you know, canary in the coal mines of culture, you know. <laughs> they're, uh, they, they go right into the poison and they sing. And, and then they, be the way into identifying something that is both wrong, uh, that is dehumanizing, that, that is corrupt, um, but with proper communal strength, you will have expression that will lead to the other side, you know, the other side into hope. So, so that's, that's kind of, um, uh, that takes multiple le levels of accountability, I think. So, excuse me. Yes, yes this one uh, also, I was thinking about uh, what you just said with my question, that uh, with this great responsibility, that also this fear. Mm -hmm. And um, oftentimes the artist is, uh, the sensitive, the um, um, group of the society that mm -hmm. suffer in this uh, particular uh, way of feeling so deeply and uh, feeling the call mm -hmm. and at the same time having this great insecurity and fear mm -hmm. of how to, especially as a young artist, but uh, right, also right. as an old artist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you speak um, about that? Yeah, 
I'm holding in my hand this book by Jacques Maritain, uh, French Catholic uh, philosopher um, who was uh, instrumental in articulating um, some, some of the uh, images that George Rouault painted. He, he was literally in his studio every day speaking theology to him and philosophy. And this book is called Responsibility of the Artist. <laughs> um, and you can actually get it online. Books are no longer printed, so, so it's, 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 if you, even if you go to Amazon, it's, it's expensive. <laughs> so um, you, you can um, get it online. And it, I recommend this book highly uh, to you. Um, because it's one of the few books where he, I think, correctly identifies what is, what is that responsibility and uh, calling. And um, I, I just have um, all sorts of um, um, questions that comes to you know, your, your question. Uh, but let me read a passage to you here because I, I think this kind of gets to it. Um, first, the artist, in his most intimate creative activity, lives on the senses, and the delights of the intelligence permeated sense. It is through emotion that world penetrates into him. He is sensitized to the world and all the vagr vagr vagrancies of beauty. As Leon Bloy put, puts it, the artist's master faculty, the imagination, is naturally and passionately anarchic. <laughs> the poet is both a madman carried along by irrational inspiration and a craftsman exercising for his work the shrewdest operative reason. How could you expect from him that stable balance <laughs> and constant attention to the rule of reason, which perfection and moral life seem to require? Second, when it comes especially to writers, they need to know the recesses of evil as well as those of the good in a human being, and not through an abstract and the theoretical knowledge but as an author of treatise of moral theology, I'm, I'm sorry, as an author of treatise of moral theology does, but by experience in, and in concrete existence. Hmm. And he, he goes on to identify uh, what he calls the virtues of art as, as it's separate from moral virtues of a person, which is rather helpful because we often confuse the two. And um, it, 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 it's very difficult to um, help the process if, if we confuse the two. So, does that get to some of that? Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi. <clears throat> um, you were talking a lot about um, I guess concepts of being a catalyst uh, to the right. masses right. and a little bit about craft recently. Um, and so over the course of the year of the arts, I've been kind of hearing things about um, discussions about Christian art being sometimes too didactic. Um, and then you're talking about abstraction. So I'm wondering if art is best not overly didactic. Mm. There's an outside of responsibility for teachers to equip others to extrapolate what might not be obvious. Um, specifically maybe to people that never thought I can draw in the Bible. Um, and so there does seem to be, though, a very limited privileged sphere of people who are exposed to art and that can in inspire and prompt imagination and who also can make a further step in process to exegete the work properly. Mm -hmm. um, so how would you, what would you say like, we could do to expand this demographic from graduate students and wealthy art collectors to include maybe more orphans, widows, the alien and the financially broken. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And is there some kind of visual language that we need to address in that? Mm. Um. Um, 
Well, your question assumes many things. <laughs> so I have to kind of begin to think about it from the perspective of, so, so you're saying that art today does not do that. Right. Right, right, sure. Right. Right. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I, 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 um, I, I know what you're getting at, but I, I, I'm, I'm trying to be careful not, not to, um, Assume too much. <laughs> if, if, I, if this was a one-to-one -one conversation, I, I can probably address it directly. Uh, and, and you know, the, the, the issue is it's 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 like the matrix. <laughs> like we're like above, <laughs> and actually, what you're asking is below. <laughs> So we, we kind of have to, you know, if we all take the red pill and go down the rabbit hole, we can have that discussion. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, right, but, but I, I think <laughs> because we're living in this utilitarian, pragmatic world, okay, where everything is tainted by this, uh, what, I, what I think is a disease of sorts, um, the gift of the enlightenment is pragmatism, but we have taken that to the extreme of, you know, this utilitarian pragmatism in which we, we have to uh, prove everything to be, you know, to, to be of value. So anything that cannot be measured, anything that cannot be um, validated by di didactic means or rational means is discarded as unnecessary. So that's the world we live in. So that's the matrix. <laughs> so we are operating as if we do not need mystery, that we, we have everything um, accounted for, um, that we can solve, um, uh, we assume that we can solve problems by, by science and, and, and rational thinking. In, in fact, when, when we look at our lives, it's, it's everything that conspires um, against that um, is, is left unsaid, okay? So there's, there's this huge area of experience where we don't actually get at because we, we live, in, live in this world that denies the, really the mystery of existence. Um, and and so, so you have to kind of start, start from there and, and say that, okay, so, if that's, that's the culture we live in, if you're an artist, you, you're going to be running up against this all the time, okay? We better get used to it. <laughs> Every time we talk about art, people, people will not have a grasp on, uh, because, because we don't uh, fully understand the, the mystery of experience. But on the other hand, okay, you talked about orphans and so forth. Every single human being, I think, when you think about what is the most important part of your life, the most important experience that you had as a human being, when you pause and think, that cannot be measured. That cannot be dis you know, described or, um, uh, or, or even categorized in, in these pragmat pragmatist ways. And, it's not something that you can even use because human beings cannot be used. If you love somebody, you love that person, you know? And we, we think today knowledge is information. Knowledge is this um, way of understanding rationally what the information comes to you and being able to process it and diagnose it. But that's different from knowing a person. 
right? That's tacit knowledge. So Maritain is talking about this in, in 1950s when, when everybody was going the other way. He was saying, no, 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 you're gonna lose, you're gonna be dehumanized and fragmented and, and, and all the philosophical uh, points, foundations will, will corrode and, and you will not be able to stand on, on, on any kind of truth. You know, let alone biblical truth, you will not be able to consistently make an argument about anything. <laughs> you, you would lose your capacity to reason, in a, in a sense, if, if you throw, throw out mystery, if you throw out. And, and so I, I think, to me, that's the discussion. And, and I think it's not, and I also think it's not about art. It's about the gospel. That's, that's why it's so important. And, um, you know, Tim Ketter, uh, my, my pastor, a redeemer, in his session to many pastors that, it, that he does these seminars, he, he, you know, he would stand up and ask, well, how, many, how much of the gospel do you think you understand? <laughs> and, you know, 90%, 80%. And he says, I think I understand less than 10%. <laughs> so I'm like, if Tim Keller understands less than 10%, I'm like 0 0.011, you know, <laughs> something like that, you know. Um, and I think Tim is right. I, I don't think we understand the gospel. We don't understand God. There's mystery here. And if we think we understand it, that's when all these things break into a decision making that makes, makes us think that we know what we're doing. <laughs> and we don't. And art is something that gets into that, you know, and, and shakes it up and, and then makes us realize, awaken us to realize that, my goodness, we, we are being held by this mystery of love, nothing may make sense, and yet there is there is this reality, you know, and and so uh, to, to answer you, I, I can't answer your question <laughs> directly, but I, the, to address it, I think the, the the perspective has to be yes, there there is this. Um, possibility of integration, um, where um, all the fragmented pieces can come together. But if we think we, are, we can do that, we're in trouble too. So uh, art has to be faithful to, to the fragmentation. And so that, that's why it makes it difficult for a, a person expecting that to, to get it. So we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, well, yeah. We got to close. We got to close. Okay. Oh, well, thank you very much. You're welcome. For being okay. Here tonight. Thank you. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.